Okay, everyone. It's 202 on the East Coast, 232 in Newfoundland. That's what they say on the CBC down here. Uh, never really heard of another 30 uh, minute time zone, but anyway, that's life in Atlantic Canada. Uh, I assume we have folks from all over. I want to welcome you today. My name is Donald Kalorn. I am with the Prince Edward Island Federation of Agriculture and Farm and Food Care Prince Edward Island. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with farm and food care, uh, we do have three different provincial groups throughout Canada in Ontario, Saskatchewan, and here in Prince Edward Island. We are the newest group, and we're very pleased to, uh, to be part of the uh, farm and food care movement. The collective vision of the group is to connect consumers to truthful information about food and uh, how that food is grown. That's our mission. Uh, we want to thank our partners for making this winter speaker series possible. Uh, they are the Agri Competitiveness Program, which is under the Canadian Agriculture Partnership. The intent around the winter speaker series is to continue the conversation about food. Uh, we are pleased with the response to last year's series and are uh, very happy to be doing it again and hope that you uh, take value from today's presentation. Uh, with respect to today's uh, presentation, I would ask that everyone keep their video and microphone off. And if you do have any questions, please post them in the Q&A function of Zoom. At the end of the presentation, we'll have approximately 10 to 15 minutes for questions, and that will be moderated by my colleague, Kelly Daynard from food, uh, pardon me, Farm and Food Care Ontario. And I wanna thank Kelly, uh, who's gone above and beyond in, uh, in uh, getting us ready for today's, uh, today's presentation. So uh, our speaker today is uh, fellow Prince Edward Islander, Ian Affleck. Uh, he is the Vice President of Plant Biotechnology for CropLife Canada, and in that role, uh, Affleck works with domestic and international agricultural stakeholders and governments on the development of policies, regulations, and science related to plant biotechnology. Prior to joining CropLife Canada, uh, Ian worked at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for 10 years, and his work there focused on the regulation of novel plants and new varieties. Uh, Ian holds a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the Nova Scotia Agricultural College, concentrating on agronomy and pest management. He also holds a Master's Degree in Agriculture from the University of Guelph, specializing in horticulture and plant breeding. Uh, Ian has been involved in agriculture from a uh, very early age, uh, and he did grow up uh, on a potato farm uh, here uh, in Prince Edward Island in the beautiful community of Bedeck on the South Shore. So I, uh, without further ado, I'm very pleased uh, to turn it over to uh, Ian Affleck. Uh, Ian, my president, uh, Ron Maynard, sends his regards, says, say hello to your mother. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invite and to... Uh... For all the farm and food care associations involved in in today's um, opportunity to to discuss these issues so as i said i grew up at pei in a potato farm and, and i've always been really passionate about agriculture so excited to get to talk about some common topics that are that are brought up often whether it be over the dinner table or just with people you may meet and i i think we have a diverse group of um, attendees today both people involved in farming as well as people that are just interested in farming so I'll try to touch on the level of detail here that uh, some things, if you're from a farm, you might already know, but I'm, I'm going to kind of start at the beginning and uh, work, uh, work our way forward. So I'll share my presentation here, assuming I can do this correctly. Let's see how this works. There we go. Um, so how plant science uh, innovations are helping make food more sustainable. Um, when it when we think about a farm, there's so many different tools that a farmer has to use in order to bring their crop to the marketplace. And, and this includes mechanization like tractors and um, applying different kinds of tillage to data and understanding soil tests and using economic uh, management programs to understand what's gonna make sense economically for their farm. Um, adding in, you know, all kinds of different data tools, approaches, GPS technology. And one subset of these technologies is plant science innovations, and specifically the topics we're going to talk about today, which are pesticides, gene editing, and GMOs. And the reason that we're talking about those three is they're often the headline grabbers, which uh, is really unfortunate because farming is much more diverse. It's much more, it's such a broad activity, um, but often these are the things that grab the headlines and might uh, create the most questions you might receive when thinking about or talking about agriculture. So we're going to dive into those a bit today. And when we say making food more sustainable, there's a sustainability means a number of different things. There's environmentally sustainable um, in general for, for the environment and the country we live in. 
There's economically sustainable for the farm itself to make sure that the farm can continue on. And there's also sustainable from a point of view of food security and affordable and available food. So sustainability is a big word and we'll, we'll try to unpack that a little as we go forward. So I'll move to slide two. So as Crop Life Canada, um, who I work for, we're a trade association that represents a wide variety of agricultural companies that are both small, medium and large enterprises that are both Canadian or international. And they're all in the plant science space of looking toward challenges in either agriculture, challenges that farmers face or challenges that the um, consumer faces and how can they invent solutions to that and then sell those into the agricultural marketplace to try to help move the food system forward. So uh, a wide variety of companies that are working in this space. So plant science innovations are help, helping build healthier communities across Canada, protect the environment and grow the economy. What I've mentioned before, and there's three real key ways that that happens. It's ensuring access to affordable and nutritious food. There's helping farmers improve their productivity and sustainability and driving general economic growth. And you could almost go back to the top and, and take where it says plant science innovations are helping build a healthier communities. You can almost replace that with agriculture. It's really agriculture that is building these benefits and plant science innovations are just some of the tools we look to put in the hands of farmers in order to help them with that goal. Um, one analogy that I've, I've heard used is, you know, when you think about a, a house being built, um, the hammer is just one tool of many that is used to build that house, same as a GMO, gene editing, or uh, pesticides are just one of many tools that a farmer is going to use on their farm to, to build that house, to put that food on the table. Um, but like we said, it's the headline grabber, so it gets a little bit more attention. So when we boil plant science innovations down into what we're going to cover today, there's really two general buckets. One is plant breeding innovations, which is a combination of traditional breeding, which has been done for hundreds of years and still forms the majority of plant breeding that's done. And then there's the modern breeding practices, for example, gene, edited, uh, gene editing or genetic modification, which are used to help out with those breeding processes. They're tools for plant breeders to bring better varieties to market, but they're all used in conjunction. There's many different plant breeding tools. And then there's pest control products that help reduce crop damage, diseases, and insect infestations. So really what you're doing is you're trying to make the best variety possible with the most potential to deliver food onto the table. And then with pest control products and other activities, you're looking to protect that food as much as possible so you get the most of it off the field uh, and to the consumer. So the two work hand in hand in terms of create the best variety with the most potential and then protect it from the things that are trying to damage it. So I'm gonna split the presentation into two. I'll start with plant breeding um, innovations. We'll start there and then we'll move to um, the pest control. And my PowerPoint has decided to change. One moment Why I restart that. There we go. It is not a presentation without a small technical hiccup. There we go. So for Plant breeding innovations, I'll start. I think it's important to put our modern plant breeding tools in the context of the history of plant breeding, which is really long. And now I'm biased, I study plant breeding, but I find it quite interesting. So I'm going to make you suffer through it as well. <laughs> so we've been really plant breeding for almost 10,000 years. So go back to when human history were hunter gatherers. Um, you can go back uh, almost 10,000 years. And when the first hunter-gatherer realized it's a lot easier to plant the seed outside my hut than it is to go look for it in a meadow. They noticed that where they dropped the seeds the year before, there was new wheat plants growing. So let's just do that. And suddenly we weren't hunter-gatherers, we're agriculturalists. They didn't know at the time they were starting, they were kickstarting plant breeding that 8,000 years ago. And then moving from there about 7,000 years ago, they started realizing that, oh, if we keep the best the best plants that resulted from those seeds and plant those next year, our crops keep getting better and better and better. They didn't realize they were selecting for better genetics. They were, they were inadvertently breeding the best plants together by planting them near each other, but they were marching forward the crops that they had at that time, making them a little bit better every year. Now, technology didn't advance fast. That's about as good as it got for almost 7,000 years. But starting in about 1,000 BCE, 
farmers started realizing if we really focus on elements of plants we like the most, we can make some pretty impactful changes on these varieties, resulting in new uses for our food. So broccoli didn't exist before 600 BC. It's a relatively new, um, you know, in the scale of human history, it's a relatively new crop. And they did, and we'll talk about how they did that here in a slide or two, because it's an interesting story. But realizing you could influence plants by, by choosing the plants that express the parts you like the most was kind of the height of technology at that time. So go forward another 2000 years, and then we start to realize you can cross breed, breed plants that are similar. So someone planted a uh, Jamaican blood orange by an Indonesian pomelo in the uh, Caribbean islands, two, two trees that don't grow anywhere near each other, not knowing they were related, and they crossed and created grapefruit. So grapefruit didn't exist till 1750. Um, it, the two trees cross-pollinated. They ended up with this interesting kind of middle, this fruit that didn't look like anything they'd seen before. They thought it was fantastic. They decided to keep it. And that's how we invented grapefruit. So skip forward a hundred years, not, you know, at that time we still didn't understand how characteristics passed between two different plants that we were trying to uh, encourage in agriculture. And then Mendel figured out that there was math behind this. We could predict how often a certain gene would move in a certain direction or a certain characteristic. And you might remember this from even high school where we talk about eye color and, you know, dominant genes and recessive genes, the wrinkly peas, the smooth peas. So Mendel figured out there's math behind this. It's, it's not totally random, it's predictable. And that was the beginning in the field of genetics. This is when we started realizing there was genes and we could track these genes and understand how to influence them. Go forward to 1940 and we realize that there's more to it than even the genes the plants have. Every time something crosses, and this is true for everyone on the call today, we're, we're not 50-50 of our two parents. We're more like 49%, 49% with 2% really unique mutations that are uniquely you. And this is true in plants as well. And sometimes these mutations are super beneficial for agriculture. So we learned in the 40s how we could encourage more of that variation and kind of farm the variation to make better and better varieties. And that was kind of what they called the green revolution when we really started to increase the ability to make yields off of existing varieties. Jump ahead to 73, a grad student invents the technique that you'd use for genetic engineering moving forward. So that's when GMOs, the technology was invented. 1996, we see the first GMOs on the market. Uh, corn, soybean, and canola come to Canada. Um, in the 1998, GM technology was used by a, a university researcher in Hawaii to save the Hawaiian papaya industry from a disease that was wiping it out, which is why 80 to 90% of all papayas in the world are GMO um, from that one variety that was developed by that university and given to the farmers there. Um, Move to the 2000s, we have a whole suite of other breeding technologies that are used. Marker assisted breeding, where you can follow those genes around the plant. And try to make sure that as you're breeding plants together with traditional breeding techniques, the right genes are the ones that you're keeping on. Uh, these don't get talked about much because as we said, they're not the headline grabbers, but there's many in that toolbox for plant breeders. Uh, 2014, we start to see another phase of GMOs, which are more focused on consumer traits. So the non-browning, non-bruising Arctic apple was really exciting. And then a similar trait in potatoes that reduced bruising um, which made it more efficient for processing, harvesting, and, and sending on to the food industry. So that's the history of plant breeding. We've been doing this for a long time. So visually, what does this look like? If you look at wild emmer all the way on the left side of your screen, that's kind of the best idea of what ancient wheat looked like. The kernels were super fragile. They'd fly off in the wind. They'd fall all over the place. Super good if you're a plant trying to spread your genes out wide and kind of dominate an area in a field. Not great if you're a farmer trying to collect those seeds, you don't want them scattered all over the place. So as they were selecting those wheat varieties, they would select them to hold the kernels, that's your domesticated emmer, then they wanted bigger kernels, look kind of like durum wheat, and then you eventually get to the really efficient common wheat that we have today. Another great example is the corn. Corn started as a grass called teosinte, and you can see it there on the bottom left, and the, the kernels were hard as rock. And over a number of thousand of years, they selected the grass with the softer kernels that was easier to make bread out of, make corn, uh, corn dust out of, um, corn flour, and eventually you end up with the corn we have today. So this isn't GMOs, this isn't gene editing. This is just thousands of years of persistence uh, in plant breeding. Another great example is bananas. Uh, the kind of ancestor of banana on the left, 
those are nuts that you couldn't eat that are in there. And then they selected for the ones that had the most flesh over thousands of years. And you get to our modern day bananas that we have today, much more efficient. One of my favorite examples is this Brassica oleracea, kind of wild mustard, wild cabbage. That grew all across Europe and Asia. And depending on what culture and their flavors and pr preferences were, they would select that plant that produced more terminal buds, for example, on the left. Eventually it morphed into cabbage. If you selected flower clusters, you get cauliflower. You select leaves, you ended up with kale. So all of these different things on the bottom are just as similar as red potatoes and white potatoes, a russet Burbank, a Shepherdy, a Yukon Gold, you name it. Those are the equivalent of kohlrabi, kale, broccoli to cauliflower. They're really just the same plant expressing their genes differently. I don't know who spent thousands of years on Brussels sprouts. Doesn't seem like the best use of time to me, but to each their own. But when you see that and you realize how much just conventional plant breeding can, can change a plant to be more useful, I, it's, it's pretty interesting. So from there, that conventional breeding background, and then we add modern plant breeding techniques to it, like genetic modification, there's a lot of things that we can do um, to advance those plants. So using genetic modification and inserting genes that have valuable traits, these are the biotech crops, the GMOs that we grow in Canada. Corn, soybean, canola, potatoes, apples, alfalfa, and sugar beets. Um, most common trait is herbicide tolerance, uh, helping the farmer manage those weeds more effectively. Um, the more effective you can manage the weeds, the least amount of time you have to till the soil, the less you till the soil, the more it maintains carbon, uh, organic matter, it retains moisture, so better uh, overall for the, the farm in general. Insect resistant corn, which does a great job of, of protecting corn from caterpillars. We have some higher oil profile uh, products, which really help um, in, in for healthier foods. Um, but these are the ones that we see commercially grown in Canada. Not very many apples, that's mostly grown in the United States. There are a few other plant breeding innovations. They're not GMOs, but they're similar. So sunflower, canola, durum, wheat, and lentils also have herbicide tolerance, not from GMO technology, just from conventional breeding. but um, just sharing that those are out there as part of that toolbox of plant breeding innovations. And then globally, we see a wider variety of crops like cotton, uh, the papaya that we mentioned before, disease resistant squash, poplar trees and eggplant. So these um, are not grown in Canada. Uh, cotton would and the papaya would be imported into Canada, but most of these are grown and consumed in the countries where they're used. So that's what we're seeing around the world from a GMO point of view, I'll do a brief overview of gene editing and then I'll compare the two to kind of give uh, um, a, a general overview of what the two technologies really mean in plant breeding. So what is gene editing? So when you compare the two, and I'll do that in the next slide, um, gene editing is when you can move into a plant and inside its existing DNA, you can make precise changes to the existing DNA to get the outcome you want. And this is very similar when we look at that 10,000 year history of plant breeding. You were often making crosses just hoping that randomly the right genes would land where they're supposed to. And you do thousands and thousands and thousands of crosses looking for that spontaneous variation we talked about or the movement of the gene that you wanted. And it took a long time uh, and plant breeders are incredibly committed to making these positive changes happen. Gene editing allows you to say, I know what I want to do. I can just go in and make that little cut and make that change happen. If you can imagine, um, gene editing is, is built on the idea that DNA is like a long storybook of information. We've read all that information now. We know exactly how the story works. And we can just move in and make a little tweak uh, to a word or a sentence or a letter and make that story even better. The difference between this and genetic engineering or GMOs is with GMOs, you're bringing in a whole page or a whole sentence from a different book into this book to make it better, where gene editing works with the existing words and just tweaking them. So that's really the difference be between the two. And this little smiley guy here, I, I took this from a presentation from Japan on gene editing because I thought it was cute. But this is the, 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 the thing that Jennifer Dudna, the discoverer of, of gene editing and who made it a technology that we could use in plant breeding, they saw this occurring in nature and figured out how to harness this power and bring it into plant breeding to be useful. So this little 
molecule lines up perfectly with the part of the DNA that matches its, its construct. It makes the little snip and then you might have a, a more disease resistant wheat afterwards if that's what you were going for. So to put these two things all in one bubble, we have plant breeding, which is a big basket of tools that a plant breeder uses. Gene editing works within the existing genetic code for improvements that could occur in nature or through traditional breeding. Genetic engineering adds new DNA from another organism. Those improvements are unlikely to occur in nature or through traditional breeding. Now, one of my favorite quotes is truth resists simplicity. So of course these two bubbles have to overlap because it couldn't just be that simple that they could have uniquely separate definitions. And that's because you could with gene editing insert DNA from another organism. You could do what you can do with GMOs, but that isn't really the purpose, but there is that possibility. If you did do that, it would be treated like a GMO. So the, the, the two still remain separate, but I think it's important to be clear that the possibility exists. It's just not why um, it was invented. Uh, one of the examples that I, I kind of like at times is um, you have a hammer and you have a drill. You could hammer a nail in with a drill. It's just not why you built it. So you would use the hammer. So these two have very different um, typical uses uh, writ large. So moving, what is the benefits of gene editing to plants? And these are really the benefits of plant breeding at large and gene editing and genetic engineering are two tools you can use when um, breeding new plants. You're looking for improved nutrition. We have examples of reduced food waste like the non-browning and the non-bruising elements, increasing crop yields just by making the plants more efficient at using um, nitrogen in the soil or using uh, what part of the plant they're growing. They can focus more on the yield that we're bringing in for food, improving plant resilience to climate change, to insect pests, you name it, reducing allergens that might be problematic in the human diet or reducing environmental impact um, like nitrogen efficiency, for example, so that it can be more precise with our nitrogen applications on farm. So this is all the benefits of plant breeding that bring you your new varieties. Once you have those new varieties, whether they're traditionally bred uh, and have been built on with gene editing or GMOs or just a traditionally bred variety, you then need to protect those varieties from the things that are gonna try to rob that yield from the farm before it can make it to the table. So pesticides is a, a rather large term that covers a number of different things. It, within pesticides are herbicides, which manage weeds, fungicides that manage diseases, insecticides, which manage insects, rodenticides, which manage things like rats and mice, which you may have used this in your home. If you've ever had mice in your home, uh, farmers may have to use it to protect their harvest if there's, in, if there's rodent pests trying to eat that while it's in storage. There's also antimicrobials and sanitizers. So just think about the Lysol wipe or the disinfectant you use in your home. That's really a pesticide. And the pesticide you're trying to control is a bacteria or things or viruses that are on the surface um, of your countertops, et cetera. So anything that's really used to control a pest is a pesticide. Pesticides exist across the agricultural spectrum. They're used in organic agriculture. They're used in conventional agriculture. Um, and they share a lot of similarities no matter where you use them. And it's the same regulatory body, the uh, the Pest Management Regulatory Authority in Canada, regulatory agency in Canada that regulates all pesticides, whether they be for organic production or for conventional production. So the uses of pesticides, as we mentioned briefly, are, are, are varied and across the board, but there's so many different areas of agriculture that use them, whether it be the first pitcher, which is likely weed control in a newly established stand of whether this be wheat or barley or, or what have you, could be damaging insect pests that are killing trees and trying to stop that from moving forward. It could be diseases in tomatoes like uh, Phthoptera or similar diseases that we see in potatoes. It could be Varroa mites or other diseases that infect uh, beekeepers hives and they have to use pest control products to protect the bees from the diseases and things that try to kill those bees. Disease in grapes, huge issue in wine production. And then also in more industrial settings like uh, power lines, make, make sure they'll stay clear of weeds so they can be accessed so the weeds aren't deteriorating the infrastructure, same on road and highways. And then also in recreational spaces, whether it be your front lawn, um, whether it be your front lawn or a golf course or a soccer stadium, all of those need to be dealt with in terms of making sure weeds don't take over.
So if we didn't have access to these protection technologies, you could see a loss of about an average of 40% of our crops in Canada would disappear for various different diseases, insect pests, and weeds. A very significant drop in the amount of food that we can bring to the table. Specifically, just kind of going through the main three things that jeopardize production, you've got farmers are competing with over 2,000 weed species. Um, they're trying to steal water, sunlight, nutrition, and they really impact crop yields. Um, and they can produce seeds which spread incredibly fast. So growing up in PEI and anyone else that's on here from PEI is well familiar with lamb's quarter. If you let lamb's quarter go to seed one time, you've got thousands and thousands of seeds which end up in the seed bank and grow the following year. So the earlier you can protect yourself from those weeds, the less weeds you'll have moving forward. The less tillage you have to do, the better off your farm is. So there's so many different elements where, pest, where uh, herbicides can help manage those weed species. Uh, you have 10,000 insect species that are trying to steal, get their meal off that food before it comes to us. Uh, you see a picture of a Colorado potato beetle, very familiar to the folks in PEI. Um, they, can, they can not only impact the plant once it's grown, they can eat the seeds even when they're in the ground. So there's also uh, seed protection and seed coatings that can make sure the plant has a chance to grow at all. Um, these insects not only eat the plants, but they can jump from plant to plant and sometimes take diseases with them, creating a whole nother problem that the farmer would have to manage. Um, and they're not just limited to when it's in the field. These infestations of diseases uh, of insects can happen even in the storage afterwards, like grain weevils and other things of that nature, which can get into the storage facilities and create a lot of problems. So another place where these crop protection tools come in handy in terms of managing uh, these challenges. And finally, over 80,000 diseases, which are constantly trying to infiltrate the, the crop that's been grown. They're unpredictable. They're dependent on weather conditions. We can scout for them. We can, we can try to predict them based on weather patterns. This kind of goes back to those other innovations, those data and weather mapping innovations that farmers will also apply on their farm to try to know when to put their fungicide crop protection on the crop. Uh, it leads to a ton of food waste. It's not controlled. It can result in rot. And then for potatoes, for example, if you put, if those disease infected potatoes go into the pile, when you store them and rot in there, they rot all the potatoes around them. Um, not a fun thing to have to clean out and always seems to fall to the youngest person on the totem pole, which was usually me. Um, and then certain fungi can produce toxins that actually make the food unsafe to ingest. Wheat is a great example where if you get uh, an a certain infection there creates what's called Dawn, which is a toxin similar to LSD, and it makes you hallucinate. Now, this is something we don't worry about in modern society because we control for it using fungicides and, and really resilient varieties from those plant breeding innovations that don't allow the fungus to grow. But this is linked all the way back to like Salem witch trials, where some people who were acting strangely had likely eaten unsafe grain or hallucinating, and people thought they were crazy. So Probably a stretch to say that fungicides present, prevent witches, but it is based in history that these unsafe grains and what diseases can do to food is really something that can be uh, dangerous. And, and we're lucky that we have technologies that can help farmers protect us from these risks. So when you bottle all that up, all that protection and fighting off all those things that are trying to reduce the yields, if we didn't have that ability to protect the crops or have those higher yielding varieties, you could see a 45% increase on average for many staple foods, meaning a $4,500 annual increase in Canadian food prices. So this is another reason why a safe, stable, and consistent food supply is so important. Now, it's not only about protecting the, and maintaining the cost of food to the consumer. It's not only about making it an economically sustainable farming uh, operation for the farmer. It also is about protecting biodiversity. So there's a couple of points here that I think that are important. You'll often hear people say that farmers are dosing their crops in pesticides, and that's really not the case. A farmer only wants to use a pesticide when they need to. They want to use only as much as they need to to have the desired impact, because these things do cost money, and you don't want to spend more time in your field than you need to. You just want that plant to grow so you can get it to harvest. So before a pesticide can come to market, it travels through that pesticide, manage, um, pesticide management regulatory agency. Um, they look at the product, they determine its risks and its benefits. 
They make sure the benefits outweigh the risks. They put a label on that product, which says how you can use it. And it's very specific to how it can be used to ensure that it's used safely. And one of the ways I, I kind of compare this is if you think of something like Tynol. Tynol is great when you have a headache, but it has a very prescriptive label about how you should use it. A teaspoon of Tynol is great. A bottle can be dangerous. And this applies across the board to even things that aren't medically related. Toothpaste is great on a toothbrush. Um, if you eat a whole tube of it, it's probably going to make you sick. <laughs> think about Windex or anything you use in your home. Any of these products, which are relatively benign, if you use them incorrectly, can have a risk at the other end. So pesticides are no different, and farmers are very adept and, and well-trained in how to handle them, how to use them appropriately. And just as an extra level of safety, the Pesticide Management Regulatory Agency takes uh, the pesticide and puts limits on them that are uh, for residues that are 100 to 1,000 times lower than you would ever expect to see under real world use of those pesticides. So they look at where a harm level could be. They make sure the use pattern is 100 to 1,000 times level below that. And then they test Canadian food and, in, and imports uh, on a regular basis to determine if that's being lived up to. 98 uh, point something percent of food doesn't have any pesticide residues on it at all. And any that do are well below those levels that have already been set well below the level of impact. So what's key here is that the food on our shelves in Canada is safe, whether it's a gene edited product, a GMO, or something that has had pesticides, organic pesticides, or conventional pesticides used on it, all food in Canada that hits the shelves are safe um, at the end of production. But now getting back to biodiversity, um, through that approval process, they make sure that the pesticide is not having an adverse effect on the environment. They recheck those pesticides on a regular basis to ensure that continues to be the case. But where it protects biodiversity the most is on the fact that we don't have to farm new land. If you weren't able to protect all that food from those pests, you'd have to really increase the amount of land you use by about 44%. That's the entire surface area of New Brunswick, PEI, and Nova Scotia. So imagine having to mow down all the forests and all the natural biodiversity in that area just to get back to the same level of food production that we have today. So the best biodiversity is in the areas that we don't farm. So the best way to go is to farm what we can, what we already are, as effectively and efficiently as possible so that we don't need to use other land or marginal land that's not as productive to get those food production numbers that we need to hit. Another benefit for the environment, you know, beyond biodiversity is how these technologies have really helped with carbon sequestration. So no-till farming or conservation tillage, or we talked about using herbicide tolerant crops or even pre-emergent herbicides, and then you don't have to go in and till the soil. Every time you don't have to till the soil, you're sequestering carbon into the soil you are saving about, we've saved about 20 billion kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions between 96 and 2018, which is the equivalent to removing about 13 million cars from the road for a year. So not only is agriculture feeding the world, we've also managed to sequester a ton of carbon while doing that. And that's what every farmer is looking for is more technology, more techniques that allow them to avoid tillage as possible. The less, the less we can be in a tractor, the more, um, the more they can focus on the rest of their operation. Uh, and these are all tools that help uh, lead toward that goal. Um, so not only have we, we protected the environment by not having to use that space, but this increase in varietal um, robustness, the better varieties, these crop production, crop protection tools have driven a 50% increase in productivity over the last century. So, um, especially, you know, even over the last 30 years, we've seen agriculture has reduced its carbon footprint per kilogram of food, if you will, by 50%. So every kilogram of food we're bringing off the field is 50% less carbon intensive than it was. Um, uh, I believe it, uh, back in 1996, I think is when they put the benchmark. So 50% production, the rest of industries as a whole across Canada and all sectors have only have reduced 30%. So agriculture has really done a great job of reducing its carbon footprint and, and is continuing to do so. Because as you can imagine, the health of your soil is critical to the success of the farm. So reducing these kind of environmental footprints is always something that uh, agriculture is searching for. 
So as we move to close, um, I will say that on for GMOs, gene editing, and pesticides, typically like we, we'll give a half an hour presentation on each one of these. So I'm trying to jam it into one uh, presentation here, but I want to leave lots of time for questions because that's usually where the most interesting elements come out. Um, so I'll move forward here. Just a couple of resources that if you're looking to dive into this deeper after the call uh, on gene editing specifically, you can check out naturenurtured.com. It's a, a wide variety of agricultural stakeholders, about 30 different ag groups from producers, grower groups, seed producers, canola council, you name it, trying to get more information to be available on gene editing. One thing we learned from the early days of GMOs, we didn't do a very good job of explaining to people what they were. And if we want the public to be comfortable with this technology, we have to do a better job of communication. So you can check out Nature Nurtured. It's full of really punny kind of dad joke approaches to science. So I'm soy into you and then a little story about healthy heart oil, uh, gene edited soy that's in the ground in the US. We'd love to add more fiber to your diet, another groaner. But in order to engage people in agricultural sciences, you got to first kind of entertain. You got to make someone interested in the story. So telling that we could have more dietary fiber in every loaf of bread and how that's great against diseases like diabetes or just the fact that we don't get enough fiber in our diet. You can check us out at naturenurtured.ca, Nature Nurtured on Twitter, or also uh, on LinkedIn. And we're always sharing articles that are interesting about uh, gene editing. One of the key elements there is kind of the international safety consensus on the safety of gene editing, it being just as safe as traditional breeding, um, and really just adds more precision to the traditional breeding we've been doing for, for a long, long time. Other resources, if you wanna learn about pesticides or gene editing or GMOs, check out croplife.ca. Specific questions about GMOs, check out gmoanswers.com. And I think someone asked, we will share the slides after this. Innovature is another great website with long, longer stories about things that people are researching in gene editing, really interesting. Already mentioned Nature Nurtured. And finally, the other one we'd like to highlight is Real Farm Lives. So you can find this at realfarmlives.ca. And, and one of the things that's often missed, um, and we go back to the tool and building the house analogy is, when we build a beautiful house, we don't celebrate the hammer, we celebrate the carpenter. Um, and I think about agriculture, often people focus on the pesticides, GMOs, or gene editing, the tools that are used in agriculture, and we're missing the, the farm. The farmer is the, the person that's putting it all together. They're the carpenter in this analogy. So Real Farm Lives is an initiative trying to highlight what reconnect the public with the people that are growing the food. Because so often when it's just a technology, it's easy to be, to, to just think coldly about it and not understand that it fits into a broader activity that is farming. So Real Farm Lives profiles uh, farmers and their families from across uh, Canada. Um, we've got from Nova Scotia, we'll be releasing one of a PEI farm family uh, in, the, in the, the near future. But I really suggest that you check it out. And if you have people that are interested about farming, it's a great way to introduce um, introduce folks that haven't experienced agriculture to what it means to be a farm family and, and how you go about the, the day of making your decisions and, and growing safe, affordable, and, and good for the environment uh, crops um, overall. So those are the resources I wanted to highlight. Uh, with that, I will say thank you. And that's, uh, I think I've tried to keep under 40 minutes so we have time for some questions. So I'll stop sharing there um, and open it up to, questions. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. First of all, I have, um, I have to tell you, I am a big Brussels sprout fan. So <laughs> I now realize that I have 200 years worth of people that I need to thank. And I have never thought of that before today. So I'm terrified that one of these days, I'm going to make that joke. And there's going to be a Brussels sprout breeder online. And it's going to be very <laughs> offended at me for taking a pot shot at Brussels sprouts. If you bake them with olive oil and salt, I can sometimes get there, but it's tough. And a little bit of bacon because bacon. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that sounds like cheating. Sorry. Okay, Not so uh, we are so off topic already, and that's my fault. <laughs> we have a bunch of questions already, so I am just going to. We've got twenty minutes here, folks. Uh, put them in the Q and A if you if you have them. We're getting lots of cheering on chat for people that like uh, Brussels sprouts as well. So um, thank you from Team Brussels sprouts. So first question, <laughs> Ian, um, is gene editing regulated different than GMOs? Uh, so this is a current conversation. It's currently countries around the world are looking at their current regulatory structure for GMOs and determining how gene editing fits. 
the trend globally is because, and this is where the science, uh, the scientific consensus comes in. You can find that at kind of naturenurture.ca. Scientific bodies around the world, European Commission, European Food Safety Authority, Health Canada have all said gene editing is equal to traditional breeding and we will treat it as such. So provided you're not bringing in foreign DNA from another species, as long as you're working with what's already in the plant, just like you would with traditional breeding, it will be treated as such. So the answer to that is yes, it looks like it will be treated differently than GMOs. And that's a real advantage because one of the big um, stumbling blocks for GMOs is that a lot of smaller companies couldn't really get involved in that activity because the regulatory barriers were so high. It cost about $150 million to bring a GMO to market. $150 million. Gene, gene editing is really a tool that's just going to help a traditional plant breeder do it even better and do it maybe a, shave a couple of years off that or instead of getting a 4% yield increase, they're going to get an 8% yield increase in one variety or move drought tolerance from 10% to 20%. And that's gonna be huge because as our climate changes, we're gonna to have to keep up with the new varieties if we're gonna face those challenges. So it's, it's an exciting time with gene editing. Um, so we're really looking forward to seeing more and more um, plant breeders and researchers using it. We're seeing it, it's very big in the university community. We've already seen a lot of startup companies, you know, new players, new entrants into the space. So it's, it's really exciting in that, in that regard. Super. How does food um, compare from the U.S. that shipped into Canada in terms of GMOs and pesticides and gene editing? So for GMOs and gene editing, we have very similar regulatory approaches for the two. So in order for anything to be imported into Canada as a GMO, it would have to meet all the Canadian regulations. Similar for pesticides, it would have to meet the, um, those residue tolerances that we have mentioned. So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency does spot checks on both food from Canada and imported food to make sure that we're hitting all the same marks. And internationally, the regulatory structures for GMOs and pesticides are very aligned. There's, North, uh, there's NAFTA working groups on pesticides, there's codex standards. There's, so countries try to align their safety review process so that as it's getting approved around the world, we know where things are and trade can flow freely. Uh, when there's differences, then you'll get into bilateral discussions about, all right, so we're going to watch out for that because they've got a different approach than we do. But for the most part, they align pretty well between countries, which allows for free flowing trade. And you'll see companies typically before they launch a product will kind of get all of your key import export market approvals so that you can have that free flowing trade. And the $150 million that you mentioned for a new product, that's a Canadian number, is it? That's dazzling. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's incredibly expensive. And now that's just for GMO. So if you're, yeah. if you're a university plant breeder trying to bring a traditional gene edited or a traditional bred product to market, you're still going to cost you a million bucks and 10 years minimum. So it's like plant breeding is not cheap. It yeah. takes a lot of time and a tremendous amount of dedication. It's another thing where I come back to that hammer story. It's like gene editing becomes the story, but the plant breeders, the story, they're the one that have de dedicate their lives to trying to bring new varieties to market. And they might get one or sometimes one or two in a whole career of successful varieties because it's that hard. Yeah. Okay, question from Lynn. Um, can you address issues around access for growers to gene edited seeds? And then her second part is, what about farm safe seeds? Yes, so for our gene edited seeds, we don't have any varieties on the market yet in Canada. We're right at the cusp of gene editing becoming, like it's being used in research a lot right now and in varietal development. Um, Government of Saskatchewan just invested $300,000 to the Global Institute on Food Security in Saskatoon for nitrogen efficient wheat, for example. So maybe in four or five years, we'll have a nitrogen efficient wheat come out of that breeding program. So we've got some gene edited soybeans in the United States right now. So right now, there isn't any offerings that you could go buy if you were a farmer. Um, that hopefully will change in the near future. And in terms of farm seed seed, it, it would depend on the variety you purchase and how the intellectual property is working on that. It wouldn't, it wouldn't really change anything than what we're currently seeing. If uh, most varieties are under intellectual property protection and you can farm save seed those. So um, how that plays into the commercialization of a variety will, will depend on that variety at that time. 
Awesome. Um, quest, or comment here from Kent. He says, colleagues in Hawaii are mapping GMO versus heritage papaya using PCR with high school students. You're smarter than me, Ian, so you'll know what this all means. Using two primers, one for the chloropl chloroplast and one for the promoter. And he wonders about something similar for a Canadian project. So I, I, I think that's pretty cool that they're mapping those things. I'm not... I'm not gleaning ex like what they're what they're going to do with that when they're done. So some from a, a Canadian project, if if Kent could add a little more context as to like, in order to so so great that they'll map it, but what do they plan to do with that information would be interesting. And then maybe I'll come back to it if Kent can can throw Perfect. that in. So Thanks Kent, for the question, you're, Kent. Kent, if you're on, on jump in. So um, question Clinton um, from Farm and Food Care Saskatchewan said, we focus a lot on the benefits to farmers and to agriculture when it comes to plant biotechnology. What about the, in your opinion, the best benefits to consumers? Yeah, and I think there's there's kind of two elements to that. Kind of in the in the initial offering of GMOs, for ex in the most part, we're really focused on farmer challenges like weed resistance, insect resistance, and the benefits to consumers there are those food prices, uh, making sure we have a stable food supply, and then the environmental benefits that you get from those production practices. What's hard about that is if if someone hasn't far not everybody's had the joy of farming. And then it's very hard to explain to someone why that's a benefit to you in the grocery store. And people are busy. They got their own lives. They got their own careers. Like they don't have time to become an expert in agriculture. What's exciting about where gene editing is going and the next wave of GMOs like the apple and the potato is they're focused on consumer problems. Like, oh, the, the restaurateur gets it. I order 100, 100 pounds of potatoes and I get to use 100 pounds of them. I don't lose five pounds in bruising. Right now I get it. Now there's something in it for me. I'm more interested to understand the broader picture. Gene editing has a lot of food traits like the fiber wheat, the healthier oil, soybean. Um, and I think that's gonna make it more approachable for the public to understand. Um, but we have to continue to do that better job of tracing good farming practices as a benefit to the consumer. It's just a little bit harder to explain. Um, there's a there's an interesting comment in the chat here that says, um, you know, has there ever been any thought about rebranding GMOs? Because GMO, <laughs> the term, comes with a bit of baggage. And I mean, I've worked in ag communications oh. for 25 years, and I certainly see it. You know, what's your thoughts on that? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could do that. Um, but I think what, what we see a lot is that what becomes kind of a viral brand or what it's going to be called often you can't set it um, especially not and maybe I'm maybe I'm underselling us but as an agricultural community we only have we're a very small portion of the voice kind of on social media etc so you never know what's going to go viral right like oh we're going to call this this now so what we have found is that what you kind of have to do is you have to speak the language of the person who's interested. So if they're calling it GMOs, even if that's not a per, like scientifically, all food has been modified in 10,000 years because of our influence. Biotechnology is the application of a living organism on another, us on wheat. So you could really say everything's a GMO, but then you're not really speaking to the person who asked the question. So at this point, our failure of communication so early on in GMOs means that this got named and it is what it is and we're just going to have to roll with it and and work but but i think with with a clear description of benefits and the value you you can change the outcome of an existing brand um so i think it's a rehabilitation by communication that's going to be so important uh with gmos because it's it's such a huge like people often think that it's, it's such a massive controversy and gmos clearly didn't do very well it's like 450 million acres around the world, um, more in developing countries than in Western nations. So like GMOs are incredibly successful um, just in a very small number of crops. And, and that's the unfortunate thing is we didn't get that niche market development. Gene editing has got a chance to really serve the crops that didn't benefit from GMOs, like barley and oats and peas and other area where you can do more niche market geographical and, and food use activities that, that GMOs were just too expensive to allow for. 
And I think part of the problem is communications, right? People like you do a really good job of explaining this in everyday language and, and maybe, you know, <laughs> trying, to, trying to find a way for researchers to be able to talk about it easier too, because sometimes they're, they're so smart that they don't know how much they know. Well, so luckily I don't have the smarts problem and I think that's key to deliver, but a lot of this is like all the credit goes to our communications team at yeah. Crop Life and folks like yourself, Kelly, and others that are like kind of do a lot of work in communications and helping scientists understand what matters in communication. So it's it's all a part of the scientists taking part in learning about how to communicate. Because so often we're like, well, I'll just slap this data up on the screen and I'll show you this chart and there, discussion's over, I proved it. And it's like, no, it's not how it works. Um, and we did that with Nature Nurtured where it's like, before you can educate, you have to entertain. Because right now you're competing with YouTube and funny videos of cats falling off things. And like, people don't have much time. And you're right. like, come learn about agriculture and gene editing. And you're like, I'd rather like enjoy something else. So if you can't make it fun with a funny joke or something, you're not going to attract people in to learn. So it's, it's kind of educate, uh, what do they say? It's entertain before, yeah. and, and then yeah, ed educainment. Like, you don't have a choice. You kind of have to. Exactly. Question from Lynn. Why do some people argue that genetic GE seeds or crops harm biodiversity? Uh, I think that really comes back to the general argument often is that monocultures harm biodiversity. So, so having single, you know, like a field of just corn in itself is not biodiverse, but it is incredibly efficient and allows two more acres of land to not be produced into agriculture and that delivers the biodiversity. Um, I think some of that where GE crops don't support biodiversity is goes back to that view of everything is just doused in, pestic like doused in pesticides. And we saw that even with corn, when the corn technology is the same BT pesticide that an organic user would crush and put on top of their crop, you've just built it into the leaf so that you can use less of it and it's right where it needs to be, when it needs to be there, it can't get washed off in the rain. Like, so it's, it's kind of, I, I think it goes back to a narrative of an early, a late 90s, early 2000s fear about gene, uh, GMOs in general, which comes from a failure of developers and others to communicate the reality of GMOs. We were absent for a solid 20 years there of doing really good public communication. And, and that view had become really heavily ingrained that, that, they, were, that they were negative for biodiversity. Awesome. Um, Kent has put some more information in the chat. If you can see oh, yes. Ian about um, about the Hawaii project. Oh yeah, no, that's super cool. To like, so people would just learn more about what DNA is and like how these things work, and that it's not unapproachable. Uh, I think that stuff is is fantastic. I can remember uh, when I used to work for the government, we used to do road shows. Um, and you would do the like basic DNA extraction where you could extract the DNA from crushed up plant matter and you'd see the little white stuff floating around in the jar. And you're like, that's DNA. And I, I think it's finding projects like that that make, that take off the, the mystique of all this is, is really important. And, and, and Kent, you've hit on something that, that goes back to that original point. We talk about doing more public communication. Even better than that is start earlier in the science classes of explaining how these sciences impact agriculture or discussing agriculture in typical science classes. That the earlier you can learn about it, the less weird it seems. Um, and that's what a lot of this comes down to, right? And if you can't see a direct benefit for you, it's just kind of like, that sounds pretty weird. And I just rather not because I don't get it. And I'm, I'm busy, I have other things to do, right? So we have to find something that makes a connection or remove the mystique so that it's not so uh, intimidating. Awesome. Last question before we wrap up um, is, I guess, and this one's from me. So you've worked in this industry now a number of years. What gives you the most excitement in, in your career and watching the industry advance? Yeah. And I'll just say for, for Kent and, and Lynn who are talking, I think like the ag in the classroom efforts that we have around the country are, are so critical to these elements, right? Start in the classroom and, and our, I think our Ag in the Classroom groups um, do, do fantastic. So sorry, I just wanna get that out. Your question again was, Kelly, I- Yeah, what makes you the most excited about your career and about the, our industry right now? Hmm. That's a great question. I think, I think that with gene editing coming forward, 
and what it can do. And I'm going to focus on plants because that's my background, right? So I'm going to underserve the crop protection side right now unabashedly. I think I'm, I feel like we're seeing a tech boom like we did in Silicon Valley when it comes to plant breeding. Um, the accessibility of this technology is really letting new companies come to the forefront with all kinds of new and cool ideas. Um, and I think that's super exciting. Just like when we saw all those apps come out of Silicon Valley and like all the disruption that it creates and the new ideas that come to the market, partnering with the larger companies, partnering with universities, and how many different opportunities that might provide farmers for varietal selection in the future, and, and things that might even be instead of focusing on something that works in corn that's good globally, they might be able to work on something that's just good for Southern Ontario or just good for PEI because it's affordable to do that now. If you've got a $150 million investment, you better make sure it's got a wide jurisdiction of where you can sell it to get that investment back. But if you can reduce that cost, you can do more for these more precise areas. So I think it's really, really cool what we see happening uh, with gene editing and agriculture. Um, and the possibilities that brings forward. Now, GMOs are still going to be a stable part of agriculture for a long time, but but gene editing is going to be a, a really important part of that uh, moving forward. Awesome, Ian. Thanks a million. This has been yeah. fun. We've, uh, I mean, I've heard Ian speak many times, and I learn something new every single time. Um, we brought him on because uh, we polled you, our audience, as to what topics you would like us to keep uh, to keep. Um, bringing forward for these webinars, and uh, this was one of our top topics in the in the last uh, the last time we did that survey. Um, so thank you, Ian. Thank you, Crop Life. Thank you to um, the Agri Competitive Program. We're grateful for all of you for making this happen. And I'm just going to show my screen here. We've got one more webinar in our winter series. So um, for those of you who are still on the line, would love to see you back here on March the 23rd. We've got Francis Parisien from Nielsen IQ. He is an amazing pollster researcher and he is going to, um, to dig deeper into some of the trends and forces in um, that are driving food consumption in this country. And, and if you've been following the food inflation stories like all of us have, uh, this is a pretty hot topic right now for all of us. So you can register through Farm and Food Care Saskatchewan's website. There is a button at the bottom of the homepage when you land on there. And we would love to see you back a month from today. So again, Ian, thanks a million. Thank Th thank you so much. And if I can leave with one final thought, I would say when communicating about agriculture, um, don't let the technology be the star of the conversation. Bring it back to the person who's using it, the plant breeder or the farmer. It, it humanizes the discussion instead of pesticides do this. It's when farmers use pesticides, they do, they do it for because otherwise it's a very cold and, and kind of technology based discussion when it actually fits into people's livelihoods. And I find that creates an easier connection with the conversation. So awesome. if I can leave on something, it's don't let the technology steal the show. Awesome. Thank you, Ian. Thank you to all of us, all of you on the line for joining us. And we hope to see you next month. Thanks. Bye.